you held a press conference a couple of days ago to uh, talk with us about some concerns shared by uh, the administration or the National Democratic Congress, I should say, since we're talking politics here, not governance, um, pertaining to the presence of the Russians here in Grenada again. Now, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with a, another country getting involved in uh, doing business in Grenada, but you mentioned a number of things where uh, criminal offenses were committed, and I think that's where the... Uh, the concerns actually arise. Why don't you explain to us in detail as much as you can about this Grenada-Russian connection? Right. Well, let me, let me start by saying what has raised our concern, especially at this time, is that on the very eve of the elections, we are seeing what appears to be um, some very close machinations going on between the Global Petroleum Group, the GPG, and um, the new National Party officials, that is a source of some concern. I mentioned at the press conference that on January the 30th, um, three Russian nationals, including Edward Vasiliev, arrived in Grenada under the pretext that they were coming to do business with the uh, Ministry of Energy. Uh, as you know, George, I have responsibility for the Ministry of Energy. I had not received any communication from the Russians indicating that they were coming to Grenada. There was no formal request for such a meeting. There was no agreement to hold such a meeting. And the declarations that they made to the immigration officials at the time of coming in apparently indicated that they were coming to meet with the ministry officials. Uh, there was no such meeting. Um, we picked up from reliable sources that um, Mr. Gregory Bowen, the NMP candidate for St. George Southeast, uh, that former, former energy minister, former deputy prime minister, former deputy leader of the new national party, went to the hotel in which they were staying that night. Uh, we were not surprised because over the last several years, between 2008 and 2000 and, um, uh, 2013, they had come to Grenada about 29 times and back and forth, back and forth, and on many occasions not meeting with government officials. Uh, this is not to say that they had not requested meetings on some occasions where we said no, we were not in a position to meet because we were still awaiting word from our legal advisors or commercial advisors and did not have anything new to report. But they continued to meet with some of these officials. We knew when those meetings were taking place. And um, on the basis of the uh, false information that was made to the immigration officials, it appears that uh, they and or the police uh, decided to question these individuals. Uh, they were questioned, they were released, um, and um, they then chartered a plane uh, at a cost of 4,000 U.S. dollars. They chartered an airline service, uh, Brico Airline Service in Trinidad, and traveled to St. Lucia. Um, we learned further that uh, Mr. Bowen, on February the 3rd, about four days later, um, chartered a plane himself or um, had it, uh, caused the plane to be chartered or um, with assistance from somebody else uh, was able to use that same um, a small airline to travel to uh, St. Lucia. It is not known for sure whether he did meet with the Russians who are in St. Lucia, but um, he used an airline uh, owned by a company called Brico, um, Trinidad based it appears, and that is the same company that is bringing all of the paraphernalia uh, from Trinidad for the new national party, including the 69,000 t-shirts that uh, came in. This raised a number of questions because, as we mentioned earlier, back in 2000 and uh, as early as 2003, this company started snooping around Grenada, not directly, but through Lev Model. Lev Model was associated with these guys. Lev Model came and tried to ingratiate himself with the government of Grenada, seemed to have made a friend of Gregory Bowen, was able to then um, get control of the, um, the family-owned business um, uh, 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 call center, was managing that call center. It is now known that the government of Grenada uh, invest, uh, contributed $31 million of taxpayers' money, $31 million of taxpayers' money into that company, which Lev Model was running. And up to this point, um, there's been no accounting for that money. This, the public already knows that um, in a speech that um, Mr. Mitchell gave during a debate in Parliament, he, he admitted that monies had been taken from the government's treasury and had been given to the, uh, to the families that owned that call center, and uh, he claimed that these monies were going to be paid back 
to the Grenadian public. That money has never been paid back to this day. So we have been uh, observing what has been happening with this slave model. In any case, in September of 2005, September 28th, 2005, um, the government of Grenada, led by Gregory Bowen at the time on this issue, um, signed an agreement with these very Russians. Um, we, are concerned, we were concerned about it because at that time, Grenada was in a lawsuit or in a, in a legal dispute, for want of a better word, with um, RSM Corporation and Jack Grindberg. They had given previously an exclusive right to Grindberg to explore all of Grenada's oil and gas uh, waters. They gave the entire right over the entire marine acreage, as we understood it to be at the time. They gave that a license in exchange for 19,000 US dollars a year. This works out to even less than 1,600 US dollars a month. Now, if you think about it, I used the example last time and I use it again. The average student at SGU who's renting an apartment somewhere in Grand Ames is paying more than 1,600 US dollars a month. So imagine all of Grenada's territorial waters is given to a, mass, a, a major company, a big international company, uh, oil speculator, and said to them, well, all you need to pay us is 1600 US dollars a month for this license. Um, it appears that when they realized what they had done, they tried to pull out of the, of the arrangement. Grindberg, of course, been the man that he is, Grindberg decided he was going to take them to court. The agreement provided that before you can go to court, there must be arbitration, and there's an international arbitration, um, part of the World Bank, uh, the ICSID, they went before that body. While that is going on, the Russians then came to Boeing and said, we will pay for the entire arbitration. All you need to do is give us, uh, give us the acreage that uh, the guy now owns. Um, when this came up, um, the Russians offered to pay for this thing. On September 28, 2005, an agreement was signed, what is called a funding agreement. It essentially said that within five days of September the 28th, 2005, the Russians, will, that the, the Russians will pay and that within five days they will make this first deposit of 2.5 million US dollars into, uh, that in those days, National Commercial Bank, it wasn't Republic Bank yet, which will make this payment into, it gave the account number, SWIFT number and all of that and said these monies would, paid, would be paid into the bank to government's credit. That money was never paid in September or October as agreed. In fact, no monies were paid until March I'm sorry, May of 2006, several months later, almost nine months later, um, the first set of monies were paid. But that money was $1.9 million. The agreement said it would be 2.5. It is interesting to note, George, that while this agreement was signed on the 25th, I'm sorry, 28th of September 2005, no due diligence of these individuals appeared to have been done. It is customary that before a, gun, a, a government or a country um, enter into an agreement with people of that, in that way, they will do background checks. They'll do background checks on these individuals, or what are known as due diligence checks, on the prospective business partners uh, entering into the agreement. In this case, that was not done. In fact, one week after the agreement had been signed on September 28th, on October the 5th, the government of Grenada wrote um, through the Permanent Secretary of Finance wrote to the head of the Financial Intelligence Unit at the time, Hugh Wildman, saying to them, the government is intending to enter into an agreement with these Russians. Uh, can you please do a check on them? Um, they gave the list of all of the persons who were part of that deal. In fact, all of the names were identified. It included, at the time, uh, Edward Vasiliev. It included somebody called Gleb Michaelia. It included somebody called Denis Kamilian. It included Joseph P. Suman. It included Sergei Somov and Sergei Gujra, right? These were the seven persons who were being identified, six persons, I'm sorry, who were being identified at the time. The search that was done revealed nothing until June of next year, of the following year, 2006. And that search revealed that um, as a result of their due diligence, the Financial Intelligence Unit wrote to the Ministry of Finance. At that time, Mr. Lennox Andrews was acting as a Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Finance. Um, there was a very unsettling revelation in that report. It indicated that the Global Petroleum Group was associated with one Jose Sumin Portilla, uh, a.k.a. Joseph Portilla, who was arrested and charged in 1999 by U.S. Uh, Border Patrol. And according to that report, 
Mr. Joseph Sumin Potilia had previously been indicted and convicted for a double homicide in Russia in 1986 and served 10 years in jail. So what we were disco discovering was that one of the persons who was seen as one of the principals of this company apparently had um, a criminal record and not only that um, was essentially had essentially been convicted if not of murder then some other homicide which means that two persons were killed by him and um, he, t he spent 10 years in jail and got some kind of early release it appears this of course is a matter of great concern for us because as you would appreciate George it is the responsibility of the government to do these searches before entering into agreements you must know who you're doing business with and that was not done in this case um, what is more disturbing is that um, the gentleman Vasiliev who heads the company kept saying I have paid the full 2.5 million dollars I did not only pay the 1.9 which was um, claimed by the government to have been received but I paid the full 2.9 in my capacity as Minister of Finance and Minister for Energy I wrote to the lawyers for the Russian group asking can you please tell us confirm and give us documentation that you did make the, the additional six hundred thousand dollar payment because we have no record of it I wrote to the accountant general who was there at the time Patricia and Twain, saying can you please confirm what monies had been received by government she wrote back to us and all that document all those documents we made available she wrote back to us saying the only monies that government did receive is 1.9 million dollars so here is Vasiliev saying I paid the 2.5 here is the Ministry of Finance official saying we got 1.9 and so $600,000 is unaccounted for. Yes, the $600,000 in fact became the subject of some exchanges between Mr. Vasiliev and Mr. Bowen. In July of 2007, Vasiliev wrote to Bowen saying, look, um, I've given you 2 point, I've given, I've paid out $2.5 million. I'm not hearing anything about what's going on. I need a report on what is going on with the arbitration, whether it's finished, whether we have to pay more money, what is the situation with the arbitration, I've gotten no report. It appears that he got no answer to the July letter. On October 7, 2007, he wrote a much stronger letter, this time saying, look, I've paid out my $2.5 million. You asked me, I paid $1.9 effectively to the, gov to the government, um, I paid $600,000 to Lev Model, the same Lev Model. I paid $600,000 to Lev Model on your instructions. Up to now, I've had no accounting for my monies, and if I do not hear from you by the end of October, then I will have no choice but to take legal action against you. That letter was copied to uh, the then Prime Minister Mitchell, it was copied to Hugh Wildman, it was copied to uh, Einstein Lewison. So it is quite clear that the Prime Minister himself, Prime Minister Mitchell as he then was, understood what was going on. It appears that by the time this letter had been written, Boeing was beginning to feel the pressure that he had to give something to the Russians, give some, enter into some further deal, uh, production sharing agreement and exploration license uh, to, the, to the Russians. Uh, on September the 28th, it appears further that uh, the, the government may have sent the draft production sharing agreement and exploration license to their lawyers. They were represented in the United States by a, a law firm known as Freshfields, Bokos, and Deringer. This is the law firm that they had hired to represent them in the, in the arbitration proceedings that Mr. Greinberg and the RSM Corporation had brought against the government. They sent these draft documents, the exploration license, and the production sharing agreement to um, uh, Freshfields, I'm calling the firm, asking them for an opinion. The company wrote back to Dr. Mitchell, Interestingly, not to Boeing, but to the Prime Minister at the time, uh, giving their opinion on these two documents. They said this, we are very concerned, this is the letter of September 28, 2007, we are very concerned that it would be contrary to Grenada's best interest to enter into any further commitment to the Global Petroleum Group, including a PSA, meaning the Production Sharing Agreement, or a license, meaning the Exploration License, in the short run. 
GPG, that's the Global Petroleum Group, appears to be trying to put the government under pressure. But the fact that the GPG is not entitled to anything for some period of time could be the government's main bargaining tool in trying to get the best result it can from GPG, whether that be an eventual agreement with GPG or a compromise in which GPG either walks away subject to terms or agrees to share the exploration with some more established oil exploration company. They go on to say, George, in order to enable the government to consider its position with due deliberation, it seems us, to us critical that GPG must not be allowed to rush the government into taking any further action. They go on to say, we would be pleased, this is the company, we would be pleased to advise the government, including via memoranda, telephone calls and in-person meetings in London or Grenada on possible courses of action for the medium and long term. Assuming no further binding commitments have been made to GPG, uh, we advise that GPG be told that the government is not going to take any action in the immediate term. Then, in a less pressured environment, we and the government can consult. This is we meaning the law firm. In view of the importance, and this is a statement I want us to remember, in view of the importance of this matter for Grenada, these are the lawyers writing, we would be prepared to perform a further analysis of the extent to which commitments made to GPG are binding on the government and to provide preliminary views on the government's options free of charge for the time we spend. This is how the lawyers felt about how important this was for Grenada. We will offer free service on this issue. Evidently, nothing happened after this letter. On October the 1st, a few days later, the lawyers wrote again. And um, they go on. I mean, I can read much of the letter, but what they say in this letter is this. As mentioned in our 28th September letter, we would be prepared to perform further analysis of the extent to which commitments made to GPG, including those in the Memorandum of Commitment, are binding on the government and to provide preliminary views on the government's options free of charge for the time we spend. In addition, in view of the importance of this matter to Grenada's future, we would be prepared to come to Grenada to meet with you, this is writing to the Prime Minister, or to meet in London in the short term to hold in-person discussions. So they were concerned, the lawyers were concerned, that they, and warning the government, please do not enter into an agreement that will bind Grenada, a production sharing agreement that will bind Grenada, or an exploration license that will bind Grenada without getting proper legal advice. It is dangerous to do so. In October, the, fall, the end of October, Wildman, it appears, wrote to the Commonwealth Secretariat, asking them for an opinion on the same agreement. The Commonwealth Secretariat uh, opinion says, the GPG agreement does not seem to follow what is envisaged under the Petroleum Act. The Act provides for development licenses to be granted in respect of petroleum discoveries. The GPG agreement provides for the simultaneous grant of an exploration license and a development license. So one agreement saying you have the right to explore and you have the right to develop. The way that it is done in the business, you get a license, you have the right to explore. After you explore, if you discover anything, then you apply to the government for a development license. And the government will evaluate that license, much like the physical planning unit will evaluate an application to put down a building, you have to apply for an application to develop a field. In that way, you have to see what your plans are, what the environmental uh, protection is going to be, and all of those things. The intention was, based on the draft agreements that were done, that all of this will be done basically in one swoop. And uh, they, they were very concerned. At the end of the day, the Commonwealth Secretariat said this to the government. At this point, the economic and legal section of the Commonwealth Secretariat would recommend that the government does not enter into this agreement as presently structured, uh, October 2007. This is the, this is the opinion uh, of the Petroleum Exploration and Production uh, Agreement, a review of the draft agreement by the Economic and Legal Services, Special Advisory Services Division of the Commonwealth Secretariat in London in October 2007. We also, George, um, had our own assessment done of those agreements. But let me say that in spite of these opinions, in spite of these legal opinions from the Commonwealth Secretariat, from their own lawyers who said, we are so concerned we will come down and give you free advice on it, uh, they went ahead and signed this agreement on March 31st, 2008. They signed off on the, the, the exploration license and the, and, the, and, the, and the production sharing agreement. The 
license gave to the Global Petroleum Group. Um, let me say that up to that point, no one still knows what has happened to this $600,000. Uh, nobody knows what has happened to the $600,000 up to that point. But what we do know is the exploration license gives or purports to give um, 11 blocks to the Russians. Our laws say, and these are laws that were passed, regulations that were passed in 2007, which said that the Minister for Energy can do the graticulation of the marine acreage and create blocks. That was not done by the Minister. Instead, he used a drawing, some sketch that was done by the Global Petroleum Group, and used that as the official schedule to the agreement that was signed with the Russians, saying these are the 11 blocks that you're going to have the right to do as part of this agreement we're signing on March 31st, 2008. These 11 blocks, let me see, these 11 blocks, the dimensions of those blocks average 7 minutes by 7 minutes. You know that in the, in the coordinates of the of the, uh, of the, of the, um, of the, um, of the water, they measure, they measure by, well, of the, of the, of the earth, they measure by degrees and minutes, yes, longitude, latitude, degrees and minutes for coordinates. Um, the, 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 the regulations stipulate that the size of any block should not be more than two minutes by two minutes. In this case, they did the blocks, the blocks on average, the ones that Grandberg had done himself, which they used for the Russian agreement, was seven minutes by seven minutes, which means that they were five minutes by five minutes larger than they ought to be. Five minutes by five minutes means five by five, which means they're 25 times larger than what the law says these blocks can lawfully be. But they give them these 11 blocks. These Russians, by the way, um, in fact, in a conversation I had with one of them, indicated that they had the benefit of the uh, seismic surveys that had been done by the Russian Academy of Sciences back in 1980 during the revolution. Um, uh, Prime Minister, then Prime Minister Maurice Bishop had invited the Russians to come to assist with some seismic work. The results of that search was available at the Russian Academy of Sciences. And that is what they used to determine which were the juiciest blocks at Grenada and which, were the, which was the piece that they wanted. So they got that piece as the 11 blocks they were going to uh, explore and, and develop by this production sharing agreement. As we said, the two things had to be separate. They basically did them as one agreement. Now, um, in that situation, when this agreement is signed, the agreement said um, in 30 days' time, within 30 days' time, the Russians will pay, will show that they have as much as 10 million US dollars as liquid cash, as evidence that they have the capacity to develop the block. They were to present that money in a bank in Grenada in 30 days' time. Within 17 days of signing the agreement, they write to Bowen and say, you know what? We don't think it's really necessary for us to um, show this money. Please allow us to just write a letter from a bank, from a country that we don't know, from a bank we don't know, the, 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 the head, the, 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 the letterhead, letterhead, I'm sorry, of the, of the, of the, of the bank is written in, in Russian. So you can't read the letterhead of the bank and so, but the, the letter itself is written in English, basically saying that Mr. Vasiliev has money and has been doing up to $31 million worth of business with that bank. So it says nothing about GPG, the Global Petroleum Group, and its own capacity to develop the, uh, the facility and to develop our oil and gas. So here we are. They had offered initially to make a deposit of $10 million. They come back within 70 days, says no, and Mr. Bowen apparently agreed that they should not pay the money. Right? But of course, um, all of this is premised on the fact that they were going to make a payment of... Um, of a certain amount of money, namely with 2.5 to start with. We have asked, have you paid, have you fil fulfilled your end of the bargain? Have you paid the $600,000? You have not answered us. We've seen the letter. He confirmed that he did write the letter to Bowen um, and that this is what happened, but we have not seen any evidence of anything to the contrary. So we've said to them, look, we cannot just simply go ahead and agree with you to develop and explore without ourselves doing some independent checking to find out what has gone on. And so we have um, retained the services of a, a, an expert, a forensic expert, to assist us in finding out what has gone on. That investigation, I want to assure you, is ongoing. We hear them boasting that um, we say we're going to do this and we say we're going to do that and we lock up nobody and so on and so on. We want to make it clear. It is not the business of the NDC government or NDC officials to charge anybody. 
It is not the business of the NDC officials. We are not the DPP. We are not the Attorney General. We are not the police. We don't have to arrest anybody. Information that comes to hand that raises suspicions and doubt we put into the hands of the lawful uh, competent officials as set out in the Constitution and let them do their work. As we understand it, the investigations are still ongoing. So whatever comes of it, we are not here to do any witch hunts against anybody. The fact of the matter is, we want to be sure that before we say to the Russian group, yes, we have a valid agreement and that we are going to work with you to enforce this agreement, we want to know that everything was properly done and rightly done. We have caused an independent um, evaluation to be done, George, of this agreement. And um, um, uh, we had the, uh, the Dynamic Global Advisors, a, a firm out of Texas and the United States, do a complete evaluation of this of, of the, uh, the license and the production sharing agreement. And what the company says basically is this: the PSE, um, meaning the production sharing agreement, does not follow the general outline for production sharing agreements with which we are familiar. This is a company that is well established. They do a lot of the technical assessments in Texas. And in, as well as in offshore uh, jurisdictions. And it is not representative of the generally accepted and customary types of production sharing agreements that are used in the international petroleum industry. There are several provisions in the PSA that address standard topics, but the text of many of these clauses are not sufficient to cover the topics correctly. In addition, there are several other topics that are normally covered in standard international production sharing contracts that have been omitted from the PSA in the entirety. And this is the paragraph I want to read to you, George. The PSA is actually only a PSA in name because it does not contain most of the standard provisions that should be included in a production sharing agreement. It is an anomaly at best, that is, a hybrid, the likes of which we have never seen before. It would not otherwise qualify for comparison with standard PSEs due to its lack of the type of structure that incorporates basic PSE concepts. Under the circumstances, the totality of the provisions of the PSE reveals a consistently uneven relationship between the government of Grenada and the Global Petroleum Group. In fact, it could be said that the PSA is so blatantly one-sided in favor of the Global Petroleum Group that it constitutes a reprehensible bargain between the parties. This is what uh, the Dynamic Global Advisors told us. And therefore we said we wanted to have a careful legal check of this. We wanted to have a careful assessment done of the situation. Nazim, thank you very much for that very comprehensive uh, explanation. Um, you know, I've sat here for the last few minutes listening to you, and a couple of thoughts have run through my mind. I just want to share that with you. You know, it appears that the, the type of deal that you've just been talking about, uh, it's, it's been commonplace in the past. And as a result, in, in recent years, we've heard a lot of calls from the Grenadian people um, for more thoroughness when it comes to dealing, especially with foreign investors. People have been asking for proper background searches to be done, due diligence, etc., etc. Um, there are some people, by the way, on the, trying to reach us from outside of the country. I'm going to get to you in just a minute. Please bear with us. Now, it is ironic, Nazim, that some of the same people who were making these calls for government to sort of tighten up the screws are persecuting the very same administration today for so doing. You guys are being accused of uh, being indecisive, too slow, anti-foreign investment, and on and on and on. And you know, the bottom line is that come February 11th, uh, Grenada will get the government it deserves. 19th. Uh, sorry, February 19th. February 19th. I've said it before. Grenada's problem is not the NDC. Grenada's problem is not the NNP. Grenada's problem, Grenadians. And if, if they choose to make the right decision, so be it. Wrong decision, so be it. Let me sneak a caller in here. Good morning. You're on the air. Hello. Okay, not hearing that person. Um, I'm going to try. There's somebody who's been calling us from the States. And um, one, two, three, four, five, six phone calls. Let me see if I can get that person on here. 
Uh, hello. Corner? No, we're not getting that person on either. Hello? 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 Somebody. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, I just want to call back a little bit again. Um, Mr. Mr. Boxer, um, I, I, I heard you make so much, so much a statement about the oil deal and the oil deal. Why no, Mr. Boxer? I just want to ask you, sir, why this moment, sir? You understand what I'm saying? Because you know that um, Gary Boeing had win the, the case against this man. Why no? I know, but so, to me now, sir, you're desperate, sir. And I know you, you, you will snatch at any straw. Don't do that, Mr. Buck. You understand? What the greatest people need was jobs and all your fails are miserable. So don't try to come on talk about oil deal. Greatest people don't want oil deal. You are late, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Yes, I'm hearing you, but you see the statements that you make. I think you ought to be prepared to, to, to clarify them. When you say that Boeing won the case against that man, who are you talking about? He's gone. Huh? You're, you're gone. Now, the fact of the matter is, we have spoken on this matter before. We have provided some details in it, and we are providing more details. Why now? Because Grenadians are about to make a very important decision, and we want to give them the information that they need to have in order to make a sensible decision. All right, let's take another call in here. Good morning, you're on the air. Good morning, Mr. Judge. Calling to congratulate you on your opening up of your station. Good morning, Mr. Grant. Yes, ma'am. Calling to congratulate you on the opening of your radio station. And I'm calling to congratulate Mr. Buck and Mistress Bernadine and tell them to hold on. They will be, they will be vindicated. Okay, somebody was just calling to congratulate uh, Minister Burke and Minister Bernadine and to let you guys know that you will be vindicated. All right. Um, Franca, you have been sitting very quietly while Mazam has been postulating. Here is your chance to repostulate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, George. Um, let me just say very briefly to the previous caller, there are no desperate people in here, so the job really is for us to just showcase and shine the light so that Grenadians can take an informed decision. It's not about, believe you me, the desperateness is certainly not on this side of the fence. Um, George, I want to move away a little bit from the whole issue of the dollars and cents, which is a most critical part in which Nazim has dealt with. But as a Grenadian, hearing all of this on Friday, I am appalled and deeply disturbed at the sort of judgment calls that we have been um, making in the past. Who is Lev Model? Who is this man who ran a call center here? Who is Joseph Portilio? Who is Jose Sumin Portilio? Who is Edward Vassila? Who are these people coming to our little spice island? to get involved in all kinds of deals. And I think what is most disturbing about it, I see the name called the Global Petroleum Group. I see something about a, a, a legal firm called Freshfields strongly advising the Grenada government, hired by the Grenada government, the then government, that they should not enter into a production sharing agreement with this body of people. I see a request for due diligence which, as you heard, was done five and six days after the agreement was signed, despite the fact that they were advised not to sign this. And here is what our FIU finds. I am reading this from the document presented to me on Friday. It says very clearly that this is a letter, this is a document sent to the then Permanent Secretary, Mr. Lennox Andrews, in the Ministry of Finance, and that their revelation was very unsettling. The letter, and I quote, the letter established that the Global Petroleum Group was associated with one Jose Sumin Portilio, a.k.a. means he has an alias, Joseph Portilio, who was arrested and charged in 1999 by the U.S. Border Patrol. According to the report, they continue, Mr. Joseph Sumin Portilio had previously been indicted and convicted for a double homicide in Russia in 1986 and served 10 years. 
I mean, who are these people coming into our country and for what purposes? We need answers here as to what's happening. And I am wondering as I go on, I mean, I even look at the technical company evaluating it and the fact that they condemn the whole dealing. You see, what is bothering me more as a Grenadian, apart from the money and who all and what all, in terms of who got what and so on, that's another story. How many more wrong judgment calls? Why is it we are attracting this criminal element into our waters to mine our petroleum products to do anything else that they're doing? Why is it we are not focusing on investors like Sanders and the ones that we could trust? How do we trust people's judgment who will put us into the Libera deal, lose the money as a result, how many millions of dollars, the Hog Island deal with Miller, lose that, that um, money as well? All the Cap Bank, the Cossinis, the Restiners, the pri uh, Pirate of Prague, the Call Center. How many more of these do we go through and attract? It, 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 it's really a disturbing thing to me as a Grenadian. I don't know what all the money involved. I think you've had that picture clearly from the Minister of Finance. I want to say, George, that the only reason we get money from outside is because of our honesty. 